Thank you very much, Angie. Um, it'd be a great help to me if you kept Bibles open or at least um, the text of that we're looking at today, which is on the inside of your sheets. There's also some headings there, which we'll be running through in a moment. I wanted to begin, actually, uh, with a question, and it's this one. This is the new series we're doing, Abraham. And the question is this. What are the key moments in the history of the world? Um, I guess, you know, there's some sorts of big moments that we could all agree on. You know, the arrival of humans. That was a big moment in the history of the world. We can all agree. Um, there'll be others that we might disagree on. Um, some would say the invention of the wheel. That was a massive one. Or you could say, you know, the, the first vaccine Edward Jenner ad administered in 1796. That was a turning point in the history of the world. If you went, um, some of the uh, biggest events in the history of the world are obvious at the moment that they happen. Um, I think something like the arrival, you know, um, the first person on the moon in 1969. If you were there, which I wasn't, everyone in the whole world knew that was a big moment in the history of the world. You couldn't deny it. Other events, uh, a little bit like the arrival of the World Wide Web in 1989. Um, Speaking honestly, I had no idea it happened um, until later. And then now we think, we look back on that and we think, oh, wow, that was a really big event. I should have noticed it at the time. Um, if we go to the Bible with this question, which is what we're going to do now, what are the key moments in the history of the world? Um, I think you could probably find, let's say, half a dozen key moments that have changed human history. Obviously, top of the pile um, would be the Jesus events, the arrival of Jesus onto the stage, his death, uh, his resurrection, his ascent into heaven. That little cluster of events is obviously how we divide history today, BC and AD. No question, that is the biggest event that's ever happened. Um, but if we were looking at the other ones, you know, the also rans in the top half a dozen, the event that we're looking at this morning that Andrew just read would definitely be up there, the call of Abraham as it's sometimes called. And what makes this such a big, such a momentous event in the history of the world is, and this is our first heading, um, is because this is when the Lord graciously promised blessing to this world. So we're going to look at um, chapter 12. If you look with me, verses 1 to 3. And we're going to see how from this one person, Abram, this plan fans out to the whole world. So look with me, verse one. First of all, Abram is promised a new place. Let me read. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. He's promised this extraordinary new place. Uh, alongside place, he's promised that he'll be father of a great people. That's verse two. And I will make of you a great nation. So already we're seeing the beginnings, aren't we, of this promise fanning out, not just one person, but fanning out to a whole nation. Uh, alongside place, alongside people, Abraham's also promised prominence. I've had to go for a P word, you know, you, you can see the thing going. He's promised fame or prominence. Um, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And he goes on. Next, he's promised protection. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. We're going to see a lot more about this promise next week. But the Lord is promising to commit himself to this particular people. Mess with Abram, you mess with the whole family. You mess with God himself. That's the, big, that's the picture here. He's promised guaranteed protection from God. And then finally, Abram's promised a program for the salvation of the whole world. And this is when it fans out to the biggest extent, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we get this picture, don't we, of Abram. He's kind of like a funnel through which God has determined that his blessing is going to fan out to the whole world, all the nations, from one to the many. And this is God's great plan, God's great program for blessing his whole world. Um, and I'm guessing that, you know, a bit like um, Tim Berners-Lee when he invented the World Wide Web in 1989, I'm guessing that it barely made it into the weekly roundup of news in Ur of the Chaldees that week, let alone further afield. Hardly anyone would have known this happened for a long time. 
But of course, looking back on it, you know, we can't doubt that this was a major, major moment in the history of the world. And the Bible underlines the significance of this moment. Um, Genesis is in 10 sections. Uh, these are the generations of, it introduces each section. So that's five plus five. And this promise, chapter 12, verse one, is the hinge. It's the turning point. It begins the second half of the book of Genesis. So just as you and I um, divide history, don't we, into BC and AD, Genesis divides history into two halves as well, before Abraham and then Abraham and onwards. Um, I was taught um, by a guy called David Jackman when I was on the Cornhill training course in London, and he used to say, the Bible is divided into two halves. And we'd all nod, yes, you know, Sunday school, Old Testament and New Testament. And then he'd say it's divided into two halves, Genesis 1 to 11 and the rest of the Bible. Because Genesis 1 to 11 is all about the problem that this world is in. It's a problem created by human rebellion against God. And then from this verse onwards, uh, the rest of the Bible, Genesis 12, is all about God's solution to this great problem. And it all begins with God's word, this promise out of nowhere to a guy called Abram. Um, we actually, uh, we're gonna have as our theme verse, Galatians 3 verse eight, because the New Testament calls this promise the gospel. It's called the gospel foretold to Abraham. So this is the gospel begin entering in the Bible, the good news that God is gonna bless his whole world through Christ. And the thing that is really underlined in this passage, especially when we look at the context, is the Lord's phenomenal kindness and grace. Um, I put in the heading, didn't I? The Lord graciously promised blessing to his world. Um, we've deliberately um, dovetailed this series that we're beginning in Abraham straight after we've been doing um, Bible studies as a church from January to July in Genesis 1 to 11. Um, so those of us who have been in grace groups, which is most of us this year, uh, we know very well the story so far. And we've learned, haven't we, about the fall, uh, the rebellion of humanity in Genesis 3. We've learned about the flood in Genesis 6 to 8. We've learned about the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And we've seen again and again the same thing. We've seen a world determined to throw God's love back in his face. Uh, we don't want God to be God in his world. We don't want relationship with you, God. Uh, get lost. And therefore, again and again, in Genesis 1 to 11, we've seen a world which has faced cursing and destruction and scattering. And so what are we expecting? Well, by all rights, the next chapter should be, of course, the arrival of the judge. And divine judgment should be poured out onto this rebellious world. So what does the Lord do with a world that mocks and defies and rejects him? And the answer is here in Genesis 12. He graciously intervenes and promises blessing to the world. Um, I know, speaking personally, how quick I am to domesticate God's grace. So, you know, if we're familiar with Christian teaching at all, you know, we probably like the idea of a God who helps us out. Uh, we, we're even okay, I think, with the idea of a hero who needs to rescue us. That's an okay idea. But so long as in the scenario, you know, we tend to paint ourselves as, as the delightful princess who any hero in their right mind would be honored to rescue. When actually the, the picture the Bible gives us again and again, it's more like firefighters coming in to save the very terrorists who have not just started the fire themselves, but who are actively trying to shoot at the firefighters even as they go about their job. That's the kind of context into which God steps and promises his blessing. This is the kind of God we worship. And, and it's not just the Genesis 1 to 11 context which emphasizes that it's the Lord's kindness. It's actually the Abram context as well. I guess, um, especially you know, if you've grown up with Sunday school, we tend to think of Abram as this amazing, you know, kindly grandfather figure. Perhaps uh, if we think of him before uh, this moment, we think of him, you know, this, this noble God-fearer seeking the Lord, desperately praying God would, you know, turn the world back to him. Actually, the evidence is not that way at all. Um, both Ur and Haran, where they also settled for a while, where Abram lived, 
they were centers of pagan worship. They worshiped the, the moon god, Sin. And the clue's in the name, isn't it? You're not meant to worship Sin. And, it, it, you know, this is what Abram and his family were up to. Abram's wife, this is more likely a picture of what Abram was up to. Abram's wife, Sarai, she was named after the moon god's wife. Abram's niece, Milka, she's named after the moon god's daughter. And this pagan background, which is very strongly hinted here in this passage, is then later confirmed a little bit later in the Bible when Joshua says to the people, this is Joshua um, chapter 24, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your ancestors Terah, that's Abram's dad, and his sons Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates, and here's the key line, and they served other gods. Do you see the point? This is Abram's background. The fact that there is a people of God at all today, the fact that there's anyone who has inherited the faith of Abram anywhere in the world today, it is all because of the sheer grace of God. Our Lord stepped down into a humanity that were not seeking him. We were hostile to him. And he sovereignly intervened in the life of a man, Abram, who was actually running away from him, worshipping other gods. And what this means for you and me is radical. Um, if you or I ever think, well, yeah, I could see why God want, might want to show me kindness. I can see why he chose me. There are things about me which would make me a pretty obvious candidate in some respects. If we ever think along those lines, not only do we not know ourselves very well, but actually we haven't got the foggiest idea what grace is. Grace is never a response in God to us and our worthiness. It is always an intervention despite our unworthiness. This is who God is. And Genesis paints this very, very dark picture into which the, the light of God's grace shines. And it does it so that we know reality, so that we're not tempted to pride, so that we, we actually glory in just a wonderfully gracious and kind God who can be relied upon to be gracious always. So what have we seen? Chapter 12 begins with this groundbreaking, world-changing event. Remember, the Lord graciously promised blessing to the world. And then the rest of the verses describe the response, the response of faith, which Abram makes. And it's, uh, as we're going to see, a response that we're required to make as well. So because, this is point two, the Lord's call is to break with our past and to wait for his promised future. So we'll look at that in two stages. First, the Lord's call is to break radically with our past. Let's look at verse four chapter 12. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran and Abram took Sarai, his wife and Lot, his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. It's actually um, written, I think, pretty matter of factly, isn't it? Um, just a couple of sentences, but Behind just these sentences, this would have been a huge rigmarole, a huge event for Abram. You know, what route is he going to take? He hasn't even been told where the destination is yet. What about the risks of attack on the way? What about the sheer practical difficulty of leaving an old life behind, trying to get all your belongings onto the back of a bunch of camels? That is not easy. Some of us have, you know, up sticks recently to move into student halls and to fit your stuff into one car was tricky, but this would have been much harder. What about uh, the pain of cutting those family, those relational ties after years of being embedded in a community? Um, some of us here know what it is to emigrate. I guess for many of us, it's hard for us to imagine just the pain and difficulty of doing that. And we need to, to honor and welcome you if that is you. What about Abram's age? He's 75 years old. Imagine him having to explain to his barren wife and then to everyone else that they were heading out to start a family. You know, that would have produced not a few sniggers, wouldn't it, around the bars of, the, of Ur and Haran. 
not helped, of course, by the fact that Abram's name, do you know this? It means exalted father. So for his whole life, his name had been a joke because he'd never been able to have children. And then suddenly the joke has got a lot worse because he's leaving to start a family. And there would have been all these questions, all these challenges for Abram. But he trusted the Lord's promise. And therefore, verse 4, Abram went as the Lord had told him to. He knew God could be relied upon and he trusted. Now, of course, Abraham's experience was unique. We've been thinking about how, you know, it was a one-off in in the history of the world, this great turning point. But as we saw in our congregational reading that we read together from Hebrews 11, Abraham's experience is also a model for, for the rest of us, for all future believers. In fact, Abraham, in the great hall of faith in Hebrews 11, he gets 12 verses. He gets twice as many verses as anyone else in that hall of fame. And the point is that Abraham is the model believer for everyone who will follow. And in one sense, what Abraham was called to do here in radically breaking from his past is going to be the same for every believer after him. Over 20 times in the Gospels, um, Jesus interrupts people's lives and he says to people, follow me, follow me. Uh, For some people, it meant a physical break with their leave your nets or leave your tax booth. For other people, it meant a spiritual breaking with their past. He says in in Matthew 10, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You see, it's just definitional of being a believer that we need to, in some sense, break from not just patterns of sin, although Jesus obviously calls us to do that. But we're also to break from this world. We're to to break from any previous loyalties, anything else which might compete with Jesus as the supreme treasure in our lives. Perhaps for some of us, um, it's a cherished ambition. That's the non-negotiable in our lives. Perhaps it's a cherished relationship. Perhaps it's just that desire to to stay in control of our lives at all costs. And yet God's call to each one of us is to make a radical break from our past sin and past loyalties and to follow. And Abram models for us not just the need to break with past loyalties and priorities, but he also shows us the way this is possible. There's interesting, um, Abram didn't grit his teeth here. He didn't muster up a whole dose of self-denial. All Abram did really was he did a calculation. Look again at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. It's on the screen. By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. So this is a summary of what we've been looking at in Genesis 12, that moment when Abram turned his back on his past life. He headed out on the journey. How did he do it? Well, we get told, verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is is God. You see, how did Abraham do it? He was looking forward to something way better ahead of him. The Lord promised him an incredible inheritance, verse 8. He promised him a city with foundations. Um, Abram was promised something way better, way more secure, way more glorious than anything he was leaving behind. He was ultimately promised a relationship with God and a renewed creation one day. So the key for Abram in making that break and stepping out, when, and the key for us, is not constantly looking backwards at what we're leaving behind. Actually, what we're leaving behind comparatively is limp and pale and insecure. It's temporary. We're to fix our eyes instead on what is ahead. And we're to realize that what the Lord promises us ahead is so much better than anything we could leave behind. Actually, I wonder whether for some of us, we've been trying to live Christian lives just in sheer grit. We think that willpower and determination is what we need. And we find very quickly that willpower runs out very quickly. Uh, But of course, the Christian life is always to be a life of faith, not sheer willpower. 
It's a life of coming again and again under God's word, hearing again his promises, and then doing that calculation that Abram and every believer does, recognizing what is ahead is way better than what is behind and heading out. Just a calculation, and off we go. So, what have we seen? Number one, we've seen the Lord's call is to, well, number one, we've seen the Lord graciously promise blessing to the world. And then secondly, the Lord's call is to break radically with the past. And we also see in these verses, we're called to wait patiently for God's promised future. Look at 5b, halfway through. When they came to the land of Canaan, Verse 6, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem to the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Um, I love this verse, verse 7. It's, it's almost comic. In one sense, it would have been useful information, wouldn't it, for Abram? Previously, the Lord had told him in verse 1, go to the land, I will show you. So he hadn't, hadn't been specified which land. So it's useful here in verse 7, you know, the Lord stops him and says, da-da, we're here. This, this is the one, Canaan, Abram. This is what I'm going to give you. So it's informative, but that statement in verse 7, to your offspring I will give this land, that would have landed as a massive anticlimax to Abram. You know, you can imagine Abram kind of pushing back and questioning the Lord and responding, well, you know, Lord, thanks and... But I've just got, you know, a couple of things to point out, really. Um, firstly, you know, I don't have any offspring, don't you? Uh, I didn't, actually, when you made the promise, and uh, I haven't since you made the promise, just, to, just mentioning. And it's not just, you know, I, just to remind you about this, but it's not just that I haven't had any children, but you do know we can't have children. Sarai is barren. And um, there's another thing, Lord. Uh, yeah, it's a lovely land. And, you know, I'm, I'm all for the, you know, the green rolling hills, the great beaches and everything. But couldn't help but notice it's also a land full of a lot of other people. And they're big and they're scary. And these Canaanites are not going to step aside easily. So, you know, just saying. And so this ver verse 7 would land really difficultly with Abram. It's not very encouraging for him. And what he's discovering is that he's being called to a life of patient waiting. This is not what he thought he was getting. It's like when someone were, you know, if someone were to invite you for an incredible feast, you can't wait. It's going to be, you know, the best feast you've ever been to. Only when you arrive, you know, you, your nostrils get twitching and you realize there is no barbecue smell at all. In fact, there's nothing you can smell. And you think, oh, that is a little bit off-putting. And not only that, but the hog roast which you have been promised not only can you not smell it, but you can actually hear it squealing in a distant field. And a little bit of you kind of dies inside because you know that, yes, I, I don't doubt it's going to be great when it comes, but it's going to be a long wait before it's on the table. And of course, that is the, the life to which Abram is called. That is the life to which every believer is called. The Lord calls us to leave behind our past, to make that radical break. And then he calls us to wait patiently before he fulfills his promise. And so what does Abraham do? Well, he walks up and down the length of the land and he's building these altars. He's, he's really claiming the land in faith. I know that one day, Lord, you will give us this and we will be worshipping across this land. But he never gets finally to settle and to build in the land. Actually, that's why one of the great... Um, uh, symbols of the life of faith is the tent. Uh, as we heard, didn't we, in our congregational reading, by faith Abram went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. So different actually from what inspired Abram to leave. Do you remember when he was back, he was promised a homeland, a mother country. He was, he was promised a true home. Go to the land I will show you. And this was the vision that captured him, you know, setting out across all the difficulties because he knew what was ahead, a city with foundations. And yet we discover Abram's whole life was lived in tents. And the tent is the symbol that we're not yet 
we're not there yet. Uh, we're going to have to wait patiently for what is to come. Now, I know um, this needs some translation. Some of us here are like eager campers, and we need to kind of realize we've probably misunderstood here. Because even if you are a very keen camper, you have to admit there is a moment towards the end, you know, and you head home and you get to have a proper shower. And there's that moment when you, you get, you know, food out of the oven and you eat it on a table and it is better than a pot noodle on your lap. And even if you're a keen camper, you have to admit that home life is, you know, more luxurious than tent life. And there is a reason you only do it two weeks in the year. Um, just saying. So it was meant to be, that the point is that the, the Christian life is always meant to be a tent life. It's always meant to be a life of longing and waiting. Um, when we were doing our uh, um, Revelation series, I mentioned one of the things I'm, I say to engage couples when I can. Um, I know we've got a few engaged folk among us, which is brilliant. But I tell them not to be surprised that engagement is going to be very, very hard. It can be the hardest time of your life. Um, it's fun for about a fortnight. You know, you get all the champagne being popped. You know, everyone being excited, going to visit the families. But basically, after that moment, it is just hard slog. And it is hard because it's, it's about looking forward to something that is not here yet. And it's with good um, reason, therefore, engagement is one of the main images we're given for the Christian life, the life in this world. Our wedding banquet is ahead. No question. It's going to be glorious. We can almost taste it. It's going to be awesome. But the point is, we're not there yet. We're just in engagement. Uh, one of the other big images is being illustrated behind me, a race. Yes, there will be relief, board, a medal. But at the moment, we're mile 17 in the marathon. And the point is, if our Christian lives feel like tent life, engagement, mile 17, that is a, not a sign that everything has gone wrong. It's not a sign that we need anything. We need to, you know, head off and go traveling around the world, or we need to find, uh, you know, a house in the suburbs and, and find a real settled something. We don't need to, you know, find that spiritual silver bullet that everyone thinks is just somewhere else. If only, you know, I had that spiritual experience or went to that place or you know, went to that sort of church or whatever it is, there's always some spiritual bullet you think is just out of your reach. Actually, if you are feeling your Christian life is tent life, you are right on track. And like Abraham, we just need to keep focusing our vision on what lies ahead of us. That is actually where the power comes to keep going in the long haul, because it's going to be a lot of years of waiting as Abraham finds. So, the Lord's call is to break radically with our past. We're to leave Ur behind. And then after that, we're to live in a tent. We're to wait patiently for the promised future. That city with foundations ahead. So we began by asking this question, what are the key moments in the history of the world? And I just want us to reflect as we close on what we think the key drivers to human history really are. What is it that we get excited about? What do we put our hope in for what we think is going to make this world a better place? And historians debate, um, you know, to what extent history is really driven by the great movers and shakers. You know, the great man theory. There's folk like um, Napoleon or Einstein or, you know, Elon Musk, somewhat, you know, these sort of people. Uh, or to what extent are these people merely products of their particular social environment? And if they hadn't risen up, you know, if, if Martin Luther King hadn't risen up at that moment, someone else would have filled his shoes. And Genesis 12 reminds us that whilst the Lord clearly uses individuals, they're not insignificant. Folk like Abram or, or Moses or Esther in the Bible, they really do impact the whole of human history. But what we see here in Genesis 12 is that the thing that is really determinative the thing which really makes a difference and drives forward human history is the sovereign intervention of our gracious God. It's God speaking that makes the difference. This is actually part of the contrast here with the previous chapter. If you're with us in Bible studies in chapter 11, we saw the Tower of Babel, the great world leaders of the day, they gathered together together. 
and they proudly declared, chapter 11, verse 4, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. And there's a great irony because none of us in the room know what one of their names is today, completely erased from history. There's literally nothing to show now from this huge global international enterprise that they sought to do. Whereas, of course, just a chapter later, God speaks, chapter 12, verse 2, and I will make of you a great nation. And he goes on, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we see the contrast. Those words set the course of human history forever after. Those words set the course of eternity. As one day, in fulfillment of these words, people from every tribe and tongue and nation will gather as the children of Abraham, giving eternal glory to the Lord Jesus. What else would we expect, really? We've already seen this in Genesis. Think of chapter one. God's word breaks in. Bang! And a universe is brought into being. We see it again here in chapter 12. God's word breaks in. And the program for the world's salvation is set in motion. And so it's no surprise that the big turning point in history is when God's incarnate word, the Lord Jesus, broke in from outside. He stepped onto that stage of human history and he enabled this great promise of Genesis 12 to finally uh, be fulfilled. He died, he rose again, and he unleashed this great torrent of blessing across all the nations of the world. God is the one who drives human history through his word. This is a great opportunity for us to humble ourselves and to, to remember that it's God's gracious, sovereign intervention into this dark world, determining to bless the nations. That is the, our only hope. And we should be learning as well how to respond. Abraham shows us, doesn't he, what we need to do. We need to break from our past. And we need to wait patiently for God's future. There's a, a few questions, uh, coffee questions for chatting about afterwards. But why don't we have a moment of quiet where we come quietly before the Lord and receive what he has for us. And then we'll have our prayers in a moment.